Right, let's get going. So, Dan, and everybody listening, thank you for joining. Um, I'm Helen Williams, part runner A6014 and event director of Harrogate Junior Part Run here in the UK. And alongside Vassos Alexander, I'm the co-presenter of the Free Weekly Timed podcast. Before we start, I'd just like to recommend that after this conversation, people check out the many Part Run social media channels in the UK and across the world as well as subscribing to the various Park Run podcasts out there. You'll find me on the Free Weekly Time podcast, but there's also, with me now, Park Run Adventurers and the 930 Club, to name a few others. So one thing before we get going, just a reminder, um, any questions that you want to put to Dan, um, pop them in the comments below, and he will do his very best to answer them along the way. So I shall introduce you without any further ado. For today's Q&A, I'm joined by educational psychologist Dan O'Hare. Dan is joint chair-elect of the Division of Educational and Child Psychology, part of the British Psychological Society, and runs edsci.org.uk, which is E-D-P-S-Y. And that's a space for educational psychologists to share information across boundaries to develop and improve the lives of children and young people. Recently, he wrote a series of four part one blogs presenting a number of support strategies for children and families living through the coronavirus pandemic. Hi, Dan. Welcome to Q&A. How are things? Yeah, good. I was just reflecting that I definitely need a shorter description of what EDSI is, don't I? It's, <laughs> that was quite a mouthful. I, I've, I've taken to just calling it an online magazine. <laughs> I think that's, it makes it sound really uh, more than it is in well, that it, description. It sounds very impre- <laughs> impressive. But um, what's, what, before we get into the, the thick of it all, how's life do- lockdown life treating you in Bristol? uh yeah no not bad there's there's you know it's i'm, I'm very, we're very lucky here we have our garden as i said and you know it's 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 lucky that a lot of the work that i do can be done at home at the moment um but i i, I spend a lot of my work working with children and teachers and parents and i really enjoy that so i'm missing that definitely missing colleagues missing friends as, as i'm sure everyone is um and I don't know about you, but I find this virtual meeting world more draining than the real meetings that we have in real life. I, I come off I come off a day of calls and I feel shattered. It's, I think I think it's because we don't get all the cues that we usually get, right? Like the facial expressions and the little gestures, and there's a delay. And if someone's buffering, it's really annoying. Awful. So so normally you'd be you would have be face to face contact with children, children and parents, or just children. How does that work normally in in the, the normal working world? Um, yeah, so I have two jobs. My first job is as an educational psychologist for a local authority in the southwest, and my second job is as a lecturer at the University of Bristol. Um, in the local authority job, where I practice as an EP, that's that is yeah, going into schools, supporting teachers, supporting uh, school leaders, um, parents, really where there's any any concerns around a child's learning or well-being or their development so it's a really broad range of work that educational psychologists do um, but a lot of it is is face to face with with parents and carers and teachers and and people that are supporting children so yeah it is it is quite sort of um it's very different to be doing a kind of like a desk based job now i <laughs> i think i certainly enjoy the go the moving around visiting different schools you know meeting different people so being relegated to my desk is kind of weird, um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's taking getting used to. So are you actually speaking to children, but on, you know, over the phone or are you just speaking, are you supporting teachers at the minute? It's really, it's, it's really tricky at the moment. Um, there are the obvious ICT issues and security issues. Um, you know, in terms of what's the right platform to do that. Uh, I know the British Psychological Society recently has published guidelines on, on sort of working remotely with mm. with different groups of people, so um, adults or children. Um, so I've chatted to a few on the phone, which has been uh, interesting, because uh, usually I meet them at school <laughs> and get to play some Uno with them and some games and kind of work out what, you know, what's going on for them. So, yeah, over the phone is really interesting. Um some are loving it like they love a phone chat and others it's kind of a bit difficult you know especially when a stranger's phoning you if they've never met me before that's really hard yeah um, hard. Same, same for parents as well if you know I've chatted to a couple of parents over the phone and and usually we'd meet up and you know the the, the job title educational psychologist can sound really scary but I hope, <laughs> I hope when we meet it's not scary so 
It's this disembodied voice on the phone asking you lots of questions. <laughs> well, we took this quote from your blog, um, which probably helps work out things now. So some children and families, you said, will be experiencing higher levels of stress, while other children may be feeling happier and more relaxed than they have for a while. Um, and it seems like the one common thing across the world right now is that everybody is impacted. So in some way, we're all being affected by what's happening in our own unique forms. So from a child psychology point of view, what aspects might influence that? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I think you're right. I think people have been impacted, but I think it's really important to look at sort of the individual needs of so if I think particularly about children like the individual needs of children I think it wouldn't be fair I think to assume that all children are finding this really stressful or they're finding it really difficult I think some definitely are you know even if I think about the the children in 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 sort of around me with friends and family and they have kids you know they're missing their friends of course they are you know you spend you kind of spend six and a half six hours a day with your friends when you're in primary school or secondary school so that's a massive change mm. um i think you know that that social contact is 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 one of the big things that's missing but at the same time there's been so many sort of creative initiatives to support that connection um so it's not the face-to-face -face stuff that, that children are used to. You know, they're not running in at half eight and seeing their friends and then running out at 3.30. But there are, you know, we've seen loads of examples across our social media of, of families using Zoom, sending cards, writing letters. You know, um, one of my, uh, she'll probably, she's probably watching, one of my colleagues has, has laid her daughter down on a big sheet of paper like this and drawn around her. <laughs> So they can post hugs to their family, which is oh, amazing. So that's lovely. I, I think the social connection side of things is, and that's not just social connection with peers. Like I, I think, a, I think quite a lot of children will be missing their teachers as well. They're such important relationships, and and teachers are so important for kids, aren't they? You know, like they know everything. <laughs> They're the teacher. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, so those strong relationships, you know. But again, I'm I'm working with schools that are trying so hard to keep those relationships going. So whether it be online sort of check-ins whether it be phone calls or even going to the house you know standing in the front garden having having conversations um one of the schools that i work with is setting work for their secondary students and then staff are going around to see their projects so you know um there's been sort of art and design projects food projects and they've been able to see that from the garden gate or you know it, and that's that that's been so fantastic to see that you know the creativity in terms of maintaining that connection mm. um but you said what else might be influencing it. I think it's really, I, well, you, you have kids, Helen, so you can tell me if you agree with this. I think it's really hard to maintain this level of like intense proximity to everyone in your family for such a long period of time. I don't yeah. know. What do you think? Uh, yeah, I completely agree. I mean, I think it's difficult, isn't it? Because our kids, we, we you, even though you live with them, you have no idea how they're going to react to it. So... You know, I think we're all kind of suffering from just being in each other's pockets all the time. And it's hard for everybody for, for completely different reasons. And, you, you know, you're right that you get a completely different level of respect from a teacher as you do as a parent. You know, I've often I said to you earlier when we chatted earlier today, you know, my son would definitely not speak to his teacher the way he speaks to me. And it's just that the, it, the change in that makes everything so much more intense, doesn't it? Because it's it's home and it's comfortable and it's safe. And it's somewhere where, well, you can just say those things because, you know, you, you're used to being told off or whatever it is. And at the same time, you, you get all the benefits of being at home. You're always with your parents and stuff like that. But definitely we've noticed that they really miss being kids. Who wants to be stuck with their parents all day long? You know, as nice <laughs> as that might be, you know, you just you, our eight year old doesn't want to be chatting to a five year old all the time or parents. She wants to be off chatting with her friends. So it. All the things that you don't realise are really vital are definitely things that are the first things, I think, as parents that you wish to come back sooner, aren't they? You know, the the whole school thing, it's much to do a bit like part run. It's the interaction that they miss more than the education. The education's a, a byline, a sideline, isn't it? You know, we can sit and teach them all day long, but we can't give them that interaction. And like everybody out who's out exercising, they can all get fit, but they're not getting the same connection with the, mm. their families and stuff like that which I guess kind of goes on to something that we were talking about earlier about 
one of part one's strengths be in its ability to bring multiple generations together and you know our kids can't see their grandparents and we're we're not being able to meet with friends and they can't meet with their friends and that is definitely something that isn't possible now so you know what are your thoughts on the implications of that and what do you think people can do about that as a turning that into a positive Mm. Yeah, the, the, I suppose the, I, I agree. You know, when when I I think most children, uh, not all children, um, but most children do say that you know some of their favourite parts of, of school are playtime and lunchtime, and you know they they really reference those those sort of the things they see most enjoyable. And you know, obviously there are kids that say maths and science, but you know <laughs> a common answer is break time. And I think it's 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 because of that that interaction and that connection. So I say I say not all children because you know there are some children for various reasons who who won't enjoy playtime or, or break time at all. Um, and you talked about sort of the the physical proximity and I suppose I suppose I wonder if that's like a an issue with how the distance that we've been experiencing has been framed. So it's it's I don't you've probably seen it on social media you know is it really social distancing or is it physical distancing we've been asked to do and, mm. and, it, and I think it's physical distancing and, and that's that seems like the specific thing so we can't physically see auntie and uncle or nanny and granddad or you know uh, one of our neighbours who we really get on with we can't physically be with them but in terms of sort of some of the some of the things we've talked about already you know if you have technology I know lots of people use it in terms of Skype and uh, you, you know Zoom quizzes and you know so one of my friends that and and her parents they do like a they met they both make the same meal on a Friday night and they eat it together on Skype but and that you know all of that stuff still is fantastic for building connection and that sense of connection is really important um, but I think it's you know some children might find it difficult to understand why can't we still see mm. nanny and granddad or why can't we still see whoever it is um and and I wonder there if it's about kind of connecting with how they might be feeling mm. so you know there's there's the very rational logical side of you know well we we can't because of disease and this is how viruses spread and you know and and we there's lots of resources to help children understand that so social stories are a really great way to to do this um essentially you know it uses simpler language you know cartoons pictures to kind of explain you know why why the dog can't go out and see his friends during the day things like that you know just that kind of externalizes it away from the current situation to, to help children understand but so there's that rational logical understanding of why but I suppose what, what I wonder is if underneath that there's feelings of confusion and you know sadness um, upset maybe a bit of worry because there's lots of talk of how you know if we're thinking about grandparents for example you kind of only have to hear the news for a couple of minutes to hear about how vulnerable certain populations are, perhaps mm. including those with existing illnesses or older people. Um, so they might be even worried about about nanny or granddad or, you know, older members of the family or the community. So there, there might be a lot of emotions underpinning some of what they're talking about. Um, mm. And I, su I suppose it's that sort of sounds very cliched, possibly, but I think it's true about seeing behaviour as a communication. So, you know, if they are seemingly really irritable one day or snappy or just easy to, to upset, suddenly they're bursting into tears. It's, 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 you know, it's probably not because they dropped their pencil. There, there might be something else underneath it in this in this situation. And, and I think we as adults can connect with that and help them label those emotions. Yeah. So, you know, help them label. Are you feeling a little bit upset because we yeah. can't see Nanny? I get torn by whether or not you should address it or and I'm not and obviously the answer isn't to ignore it so so for example um on June the 1st if schools were to go back then our five-year-old would be in the group that would go back but his sister is obviously in a group that wouldn't because she's in mm -hmm. year three so I mean not long after we kind of broached the subject his behavior did take a little bit of a flip and obviously it was in exactly the ways that you describe. It was over the smallest things. And I, and I thought, well, maybe we should just spring it on him and tell him on, you know, <laughs> May the 31st. <laughs> yeah, May the, yeah right out the day before. Oh, he's school yeah. tomorrow. And, and maybe that, that approach is good. But, you know, is that wise or is it better to then discuss his feelings and bring that out of him because I always think if I do that will I upset him more will that give him a reason to say he doesn't want to go 
or do you need to validate that? Do you know what I mean? I get I get really torn by that by and stuck in the middle. I don't want to make it worse for him. And at yeah. the same time, I understand that his behaviour is definitely being affected by things that yeah. might have been said previously. Yeah. I mean, there's loads in there, isn't there, Helen? So, you know, firstly, having having children where some will need to go into school if they open and some won't, that's not only is that sort of a an emotional difficulty that's just the logistical difficulty as well you know who's looking after the other one while I take this one to school or uh, particularly you know uh, particularly if, if there's a single parent family um and they're you know if there if there's more than one child that those logistics become even more difficult um but and then there's added complications well what if you have several children where some are in primary school some are in secondary school and you know the year six has to go back and the year reception but not the year nine and it becomes really complex and I don't firstly I just don't think there's a right answer I think it's it's really and I think the government has kind of said that haven't they around you know it's 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 not it's not a mandated sort of first of June you know parents are, are fully need to be kind of fully involved in that decision um and also, this sounds like such a psychologist answer, you know, <laughs> I wouldn't I wouldn't want to say like, you know, tell them in advance or wait till the last minute because <laughs> parents, you know, parents are going to know that whether or not their young person or their child copes with sort of advance warning better than, than, than you know, better than they do or worse than they do. And, and some parents I've worked with have said, you know, in terms of when things change oh we do leave it to the last minute because if we tell them too far in advance they get really anxious about it and it just builds up and builds up and builds up and builds up so we kind of need to tell them at the last minute so they just go into it and yes. other parents that I've worked with have been really clear about no we need to we need to tell them in a really structured way quite far in advance keep repeating it over time you know perhaps with pictures of school and thinking about the school routine um but it's it's so there's it's it's really difficult in sort of a, a a clear answer because what then I'd say is that you know as a as a parent or a carer you're going to know how your child responds to change you know mm. do they actually really appreciate finding out quite far in advance but there are some maybe there are some sort of similarities regardless of whether it's far in advance or the day before there are some similarities in terms of you know probably be ready for some of that emotional reaction um, yes. maybe, maybe it's excitement <laughs> maybe it's just disappointment maybe they're just going to hate it um and we can kind of be ready with those words you know how might they react well they might be upset particularly you know your example probably pretty annoyed that he might have to go back and his sister doesn't and we can kind of reflect that back you know yeah i'd, I'd kind of feel annoyed if that was me too yeah um, definitely so yeah the, the the validation i think is important and then making that decision based on on how you know your, your child your might child. react to, to change yeah yeah it's a tricky one I tell you and I, and I think it's hard because you know everybody is so different and we know for a fact that going to school hopefully on June the 1st if it happens would be so beneficial in terms of being able to see his friends but I think that's going to be a, a difficult dis decision you know um moving on for a long time uh, we felt that part one succeeds because of people's innate needs to be active outdoors and social which we all we really really love all of those things what are your thoughts Dan on how we should be looking at including those three things in our lives right now especially when we might have less time more stress and less opportunity mm. oh what are those three things social outdoors and something active active, active outdoors and social yeah um I mean, the first thing that comes to mind is play, right? Like for, for children, but also for adults, like play is so important. We did, as the DECP last year and the beginning of this year, we did a campaign on sort of children's right to play, which which kind of focused on how important it was for their development, not, not just sort of specific areas of their development, but their holistic development. So social skills, problem solving, language communication, physical development, you know, play kind of ticks all those boxes for children and young people. Um, you know, you, you can see it when you see children play, they, 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 they problem solve, they sort things out, they imagine, um, they work through things that we might work through using language, you know, they using role play little things or Lego, you know, they might role play a hospital and and that is that them trying to sort of understand this situation so i mean the first thing that comes to mind about active physical and social is play now i appreciate that the the togetherness the physical proximity of play is, is kind of what's missing right now um 
but playing at, you know if you have children playing with them is, is is fantastic you know the the connection that you can get through that and letting them take the lead i think is is really important you know that sometimes you know silly play can seem silly really silly to us as adults but it's silly play it, it, it's fantastic for them you know it's, it's what they want it to be play i think is whatever children choose it to be so if they want to play silly nonsense with their uh, uh, I don't know, a can, that's fine, you know, it's, it, and you can, you can kind of integrate that at home, can't you? So even if you don't have outdoor space, you know, you can still, uh, my, one of my, um, I think one of the examples in the blog that I wrote was from a real life example of, you know, how many times can you run up and down the stairs in one minute? You know, as long as you don't live in a flat with people underneath you. Um, or, you know, can you make up a silly dance to a song? You know, you don't, you don't necessarily need to be outdoors. Um, but, you know, the local the local area in terms of, you know, the parks, if you observe distancing, I know the play areas have been shut, but even being able to get out and go for a walk, you know, together as a, as a family or parts of the family, that's I think that's really important in terms of just the activity. Yes, but also the routine, you know, so I know when we talked earlier, it sounds like you have a routine before before learning at home, you will go for a walk and that's kind of every day. And, and those sorts of routines can be really secure and, and sort of reassuring for children. And I, I, I suppose I don't mean like the specific oh, 915 numeracy, 930 <laughs> maths, you know, that that might be a bit too much and, and might cause more stress. But the broad routines of this is when we're going to go outside. This is lunchtime. This is snack time. This is art time. You know, sort of just a broad morning, afternoon, lunchtime, evening sort of thing. That can that can sometimes be enough. Um, don't know if I've answered your question though. Yeah, and that, but I think I think you, you've you've answered part of it. I think the the part of it that probably affects most people is um, the bit where you are still having to work from home and trying to manage your child and trying to play and trying to do calls or yeah. emails and that stress builds up to a point where do you know what i'm just not in the mood for playing right now like i've got mm. 457 things on my mind i need to cook yeah. the tea you need to do some school work i need to do some i need to do some work work and yeah. the whole thing becomes really stressful and i think that's that's probably, you know, you, if you had a stressful life beforehand, it must make it so much harder now. Mm. But mm. whereas before you could just be, you could go to part run with your kids and, you know, and just, and all be together as family, like we said before, mm. or just you and your son or your daughter or your mum, your dad, your grandparents. And that kind of gives you that release and that time together. But it's so, that intensity and the, the pressures, I think, are probably higher now than they've ever been and i think that mm. that means that everything is, is is difficult doesn't it yeah and you know and what, I, I think, uh, sorry helen uh, i i think um you know part of that is so there's an approach that that i think lots of educational psychologists kind of like and it's called emotion coaching but one of the things that emotion coaching talks about is it uses that, that analogy of being on an airplane um you know, before you put your own mask on, before you put someone else's mask on. And I think the, tr the same is probably true in this situation. Um, you know, as, as adults, you know, we all, we experience stress as well. And, and we, we deal with it in, certain, in different ways, although sometimes not different to children. We still <laughs> slam or scream or shout or, you know, knock. Oh, <laughs> no, we, never. We do, never, no. Um, but, you know, I think if we've got to think about our self-care as well. So I think you know in one of the in one of the blogs that i wrote for park one i think i said something like um you know even if it takes you like three nights to watch that film that you really like like that's fine that's you know that's an achievement you know making when the kids go to bed or when you do have a moment it's all right not to do anything you know being able to feeling that sense of stress and that sense of what is it fed upness like that just seems like an entirely normal reaction to, to this this situation um and and i and i know so and sometimes i wonder how social media sort of has a role to play here as well mm. you know sometimes there might be a risk of seeing what other families are doing or what other children are doing and oh my god they've built a three-tier castle how have they done that we haven't even got coloring pencils out today um but that, that's kind of like that veneer of social media, isn't it? You know, you're never going to see someone post like, you know, the, 
the, the, the, <laughs> the, the struggle you have <laughs> yeah, to eat Cheerios in the morning or something like that. It's, so it's, I suppose it's thinking about adult self-care as well right now. And whether that's turning to a partner or a friend or a family member or a neighbor, just to have maybe an adult conversation, you know, even if it's just to vent, that's all right. You know, that's absolutely yeah. fine. Um, and I know that, you know, I think obviously workplaces have a responsibility here as well. Mm. And I, from what I've heard, quite a few workplaces are, are doing quite a good job at saying we know that this isn't just normal work at home. This is trying to look after kids, provide them with an education and cope with the pandemic while being at home. Yeah. And that's really difficult. So I know lots of organisations are very good at that um, or have been good at that. Um, and and I think actually if you do get downtime, there might be that pressure. OK, now the kids are doing something. I have to get on with this piece of work or I have to, do, you know. And actually it might be OK to say, I just need a tea. You know, I, I'm just yeah, and allowing that, you know, and allowing yourself that and giving yourself that permission. Um, but it's again, it's one of those things that's like, you know, it's fine for me saying have a tea, but I've got a deadline in three hours. You know, I need to do that. And it's it's so when can that self-care happen? Because you mm. might be spending so much time thinking about keeping the kids occupied, teaching, learning, you know, fantastic activities, doing exercise, playing. But when do when do we look after ourselves? I think is yeah. is the question, and and maybe that's a, a question that that's useful to answer. You know, when when is my time? Yeah, definitely. That's I mean, and I think for you know for a lot of people that is exercise, isn't it? And for a lot of people that would have been part run on a Saturday morning. And we have found that the part run community have been absolutely amazing because they're all looking at ways to get out, and that is headspace. Yeah, you know, I run really early in the morning. We've talked about that, and that's kind of my window of of headspace. But it is the the connection. I do miss running with friends and I miss seeing people for coffee afterwards and you know that's all going to come back so we've got loads of really good questions Dan uh, before we go on to them we've just got one more question and we want to know when the world finally gets back to normal what are you most looking forward to <laughs> uh, oh my gosh I've really missed my friends you know just just chilling out and and having a tea round theirs or you know that up them round ours and you know, just catching up, being stupid, you know, just all of that stuff is is, is missing, you know. Yeah, Connection. obviously. <laughs> huh? Connection. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, we've done we've done Zoom quizzes and we've, you know, we've done, uh, you know, Zoom coffees and coffee and cake and things like that. But it's not the same, is it? You know, you kind of want that 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 proximity as well I think touch is really I think people you know I find touch really important you know hugging and you know high fives and you know hand on the shoulder and all of that's kind of missing now from from some of the closest people in our lives mm. um I, I appreciate some people might not like that you know the, the touch element <laughs> but certainly I, I like sort of you know like giving my friends a hug and things like that so that's kind of yeah I, I'm kind of looking forward to cake tea <laughs> it'll probably be winter by the time it's over so a nice blanket and, and a good, good gossip <laughs> Brit gossip definitely we're definitely yeah. missing the gossip let's get into these questions then Dan Matt from Cleethorpes wants to know he says my son is really struggling at the moment and is quite low and feeling really lonely he's 13 have you got any tips yeah I mean teenage adolescent years are when that peer connection and that identity development is really key isn't it that sort of that you know just the role of peers becomes so much more important when when you're that age um and yeah i think for certain groups of people you know like teens it can be really difficult because they're so important to us um i think you know some of the things we've talked about in terms of digital connection and 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 non-digital connection i think that's important too you know actually getting something in the post you know if that's a possibility that's such a different experience isn't it you know i remember as a young person getting letters and how amazing that i've got a letter oh my gosh so you know is it is it possible to do something that isn't digital that feels a little more tangible a little you know a little more real than than yeah. just you know maybe because because actually you know you can go for hours on a whatsapp chat and and it's just it's just gone isn't it you know or or you fall asleep for a couple of hours and you've got 560 missed messages <laughs> and that's that's such a big pressure um i think we talked about validating those emotions didn't we so i think sometimes for the best intents and purposes as adults we can we can try and encourage children out of it you know there's this great thing or there's this exciting thing or this is film you really like 
and that might miss out that connection bit. Mm. Now, I, I don't, I don't want to sound like I'm judging the scenario or you know what isn't or isn't happening, but but rather connecting with that sadness or that that sense of being low, you know, that helps children to feel heard and feel listened to, yeah. um, and it gives them that sense of oh, you know, you're here alongside me. Um, and I think there's a really lovely there's a really lovely clip on YouTube by a, a, a researcher called Brené Brown who talks about empathy and empathy about becoming alongside someone um, and sharing something of ourselves. So I think, was it Matt you said that this question Matt, was from? Yeah. yeah, so, you know, how, how is it is it possible to share when when you, you felt low and alone and, and in a, you know, we might not have ever been in this situation before as a teenager, but we've, we've probably all felt lonely at some point. Oh yeah. And yeah, yeah. connecting with that experience of feeling lonely and sharing that can be, can be really powerful mm. in terms of, yeah, that's what it's like. It, it is like that. Um, so, it's, so that connection, that validation is, is, is really, I think is, is really important oh, and yeah. kind of meet, meeting, meeting the young person where they are. Um, Cause actually, they might not be ready yet for, you know, sort of happier, more energetic stuff. So, so maybe we can start from where they are, and and then move with them rather yes. than sort of, you know, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, no, that's great advice. Hope that helps, Matt. Uh, Nadine Elizabeth says, my daughter is in year six, and so thinking about her transitioning to secondary school. Do you have any advice as to how we as parents should be handling this transition under the current circumstances? Mm, I think I think year six is a really hard time at the moment um I think there's a real risk so goodbyes are really important aren't they you know the ability to say goodbye and all the rituals and ceremony that we have around that if I if I look back to my year six we had our residential trip um we had like the shirt signing we had a leavers assembly and and I think there really needs to be that that recognition for some year sixes that some of that stuff just might not happen right now mm. um and that's really hard because i think year six is a big build-up to some of those things you know in there as well you've got the no sats and lots of it is about building up to that um and now you've got sort of a really disrupted ending and endings mm. i think are really important in helping us understand what's come before but also what's coming next so recognizing that that that, that lack of ending or that ending won't happen right now. Not to say that it won't ever happen. I, you know, schools, I think schools are going to do fantastic jobs of in the future, you know, inviting the previous year sixes back for, you know, a party or a, I don't know, a disco, what a cheesy word, but something <laughs> like that, you know, to celebrate their time together. And I don't think, so I think it's not a case of that stuff won't happen ever. It, it, maybe it just won't happen right now, but that is disappointing. Um, and it is really sad because those are big, important life events. Mm. Um, in terms of like the move to, from primary to secondary, secondary schools often do lots of things, don't they, um, to support that move. So you might go for visit visit days or taste of days. You might go for like a, a summer school week for five days over the summer. And that has lots of functions, doesn't it? Get to know some of the staff get to see the faces of the children around you get to know the building where are the toilets where's the dinner hall you know how does dinner work in this school all of these things and and that helps take the pressure off when you start secondary school so I, and, and again i i don't think this is saying anything that secondary schools aren't already thinking about so far but if you haven't heard from your secondary school you might be asking about are there are there sort of um sort of video guides around certain parts of the school particularly important parts like the entrance and the dinner hall and where they'll leave or the toilets and things like that there's you know big big important parts of the school um are there ways that the teachers can say hi you know is it is it a, is it a photograph or a, a, an email that sort of introduces it where teachers write a paragraph and you know they can talk a little bit about themselves because they'd get all of that in these induction days and in these induction times so I think secondary schools are going to be doing a lot anyway. Um, mm. But but familiarity, you know, endings, uh, new beginnings, that they're the big sort of psychological concepts that I think will be really important for, for children mm. and young people. Um, and, and talking to them as well, you know, yes, I think children probably will have concerns about the move to secondary school, but they'll probably have some excitement as well. What excitement, what excites them about that, that move, about that new start? Um, are there ways that the school can have like 
transition buddies are there older pupils that can be, yeah. that can be in contact with younger pupils you know um it's it, i suppose it's and schools are going to be really creative they always are and i think we've seen it throughout throughout the lockdown the creativity of schools so some of the asking asking secondary schools some of these questions can be really helpful mm. um to try and fill in the gaps that might exist because of what isn't going to happen if, if that if that makes sense yeah because i suppose what you get from that as a parent and then also being able to pass that on to your child is a little bit of control this is what we're yeah. going to do to try and help the situation. So we're going to contact the school and we'll see what it is. Tell me what you're worried about and we'll try and make it happen. If you're worried about not seeing all of your friends at the end, let's just arrange to have a party. We'll get together with all the parents, let's arrange a party. And then if it's the school, if they can do a virtual tour, we're going to do this, this, this and this. And it kind of puts you back in the driving seat, doesn't it? Of mm. This is what we can do to make it better. It's great advice. I, you. Sorry, I, sorry the, the only other thing I thought about that was um, they're also... I wonder if sometimes there can be a sense of um, it, maybe it's just me feeling these things. Um, you know, maybe it's just me feeling really worried about about you know not being able to have a you know a shirt signing day, or maybe it's me feeling really worried. But but actually, I think reinforcing that message that this is a collective experience. You know, that that there are lots of we're all in this situation, and lots and lots of other children and young people will be feeling some of these things and thinking some of these thoughts. I think that reinforcing that sense of a shared experience can be a really important resiliency factor so it can help build children's resilience because that's connected to that idea of belonging and connection because mm. we've shared an experience so you know perhaps some young people or children might be thinking I'm the only one and maybe our job can be about hey you're not you know I think you know lots of young people would be feeling worried about not being able to see the school or not being able to have a tour or meet their form tutor um and so yeah that in, enforcing that shared experience i think could be really really helpful uh, nadine also goes on to ask about her son who's in year four and she says he's um developed tics which have been especially noticeable when they sit down to do school work have you got any advice for that well that's a really hard one uh because it's quite a specific question about a young person and then I don't, I don't want to accidentally get into like giving giving sort of solutions and answers I, that you know I think it, it, the Nadine talks about it sort of increasing at school work um I think the first thing is is schools aren't closed firstly you know if, if you're worried about your child or young person I think have a conversation with the people that know them best and, and it's going to be a conversation between parent and class teacher or yeah. parent and and one of the other members of staff perhaps a, a head or a special educational needs coordinator I think that's a really useful conversation to have have they noticed something like this before you know sharing mm -hmm. some of that knowledge and expertise to think about that that behavior because there might be various reasons for that behavior and, and that's that's kind of my that's what I don't want to sort of veer towards, you know, trying to explain that behaviour. But I think the connections with people from your young person's school who know them can be really helpful in terms of exploring that a little bit more and giving you some moral support and some some advice um, because they, they work with them in that sort of educational context every day. So mm. is there something different about school that obviously there's lots, but, you know, when it comes to <laughs> In, engaging in a piece of work what what do they find works best you know when doesn't it work and and that that, that problem solving conversation between school and home can be really mm. helpful mm. that's great i hope that helps nadine and matt from cleefthorpes did uh, i saw a message that said that's great advice he's going to give that a try so that's great jazz asks um my little ones her niece and nephew mentioned feeling anxious about cuddles and hugs um, she's tried to reassure them, but she didn't think she did a good job. Have you got any advice? I suppose that is something, you know, they're, we're having to constantly walk down the street and say, just walk to this side, kids, because, you know, kids ball down the street like, you know, yeah. like you're in a pinball machine. So it's really difficult. You're constantly telling them to move out, to move out of the way of other humans. So yeah. it is going to be interesting. I think that that's a, a great question from Jaza and definitely something I'd be interested to know your answer. Yeah. I, so the first thing that comes to mind is sort of how useful some of these social stories can be um, in terms of because I think it's useful to, to, to explain to children. And I'm sure I'm, sh I'm sure Jazz has around why that's important. Um, but repetition is really important, isn't it, in terms of making sure that message has, has got home. And I think I, I think we all do it. You know, if there's blanks in our knowledge, we kind of fill it with our imagination. Um, 
and and actually just being really factual but taking into account a child's age is, is really important factual but taking into account their age and and as i say there are so many of these stories online about using animals or cartoon characters to explain why it's a it's a good thing so it's i suppose there's a difference in framing it isn't there one way of framing it might be that we need to stay away from people so we don't catch the virus mm. or we need to stay away from people so we can protect everyone so, and that's kind yeah. of a different frame you know one one is more sort of maybe more positive more socially orientated about protecting everyone and, and one is one one does actually sound quite frightening also we don't get sick um yeah. and there's so much media attention so you know maybe there's a role there of sort of adults um kind of mediating the information from the media um it's really easy to have like 24-hour news on isn't it i find myself getting lost in these constant news threads and and same same on the tv you know it's always about this at the moment isn't it so maybe maybe we stop watching that and 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 the adult gives the, the news information and, mm. and maybe we use some of these cartoon books so i'm trying to think of some but obviously now that i'm th- trying to think of them my mind's <laughs> gone blank but yeah. there's an article I don't want to be a, a shameless self-publicist, but there's an article on EdSci, the web, my website, about um, resources for children. And there's a big section there which has books about explaining the current situation to children. And, mm. it, and, it's, and it's books and cartoons and stories that, that explain it to different ages. So, you know, maybe like three to six or older children or teens. Um, but it just uses the vehicle and, and the medium of story to help explain the situation. Um, And I think giving children really specific concrete things to do is, is, is really useful. So concrete things like washing their hands um, and, you know, role playing. What does two meters look like? Do they know, do they know what two (laughs) meters look like? Do they think it's massive or, you know, do they think it's really close? I've, I sometimes wonder if some of the adults that I pass walking around on evening walks know what two meters looks like. But, okay. you know, giving them specific things can be really helpful and give them back that sense of control. Right. Like oh, there is something I can do. I can I can wash my hands or, you know, I can sing the happy birthday song while doing it. And I think it's using those strategies can be really helpful because you, you talked about control and that's that's that can be really powerful. Yeah. Yeah. OK. And the last question comes from Kate Lucas, who says, do you think it's a worry that play might be sidelined when children return to school. Yeah. And I wonder if this comes from like media focus on catching up, um, making up for lost time. You know, I don't, I, I wouldn't necessarily see this as lost time. Um, you know, there, there might be other things learned. They obviously children haven't engaged with the national curriculum as they would have in school. Mm. Um, and you know i don't i don't want to diminish the fact that for such an extended period of time a lot of children might not have been engaging in any sort of formal learning at all um and so perhaps there is a worry about you know those perhaps there is a worry about play being sidelined in place of you know more english or more maths or numeracy um Mm. but I think, you know, teachers are really skilled professionals and they know their classes and they know their children. Um, and I mean, it's 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 abundantly clear the power of play and how mm. important it is in terms of developing children's understanding. Um, so or I think although there might be a worry about it, I think certainly primary schools will see the value of play and and i'd also advocate the value of play for older children as well it looks different sure you know a play between three or four 14 year olds looks different to play between four or five year olds but having that space to to connect to reconnect to reshare to you know share stories that's a really important sort of relationship building thing isn't it sharing stories and sharing experiences um so yes i mean having mentioned our campaign last year about the importance of play and children's right to play i'm definitely going to be advocating you know <laughs> let's use play yeah let's use it as a as a way to help children reconnect with that setting that 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 school that timetable the adults in that school if, if we can put ourselves in that play fantastic for relationships because there's going to be children meeting teachers they've never seen before Mm. you know if they're starting school for the first time or if they're moving school or if a new member of staff is starting that's going to be really important to to connect on that human level so yeah yeah, there may be a worry yeah but I think it's it's also I think as I say teachers are are, are really good professionals and they know they they know what's best for their classes brilliant well um, we've taken lots of your time. We've managed to um, 
go on for 47 minutes which is amazing and that's mm. all it's oh. fantastic um advice and information it's really helpful you know and you know for those of us who've got kids or those of us who know people with kids i'm sure that we can pass much of this advice on so thanks so much for your time this evening dan and thanks to everyone thanks obviously me. who's tuned in and you can catch up with dan on twitter who you are at ed Sidan, which is e d p s y d a n sorry for my dodgy diphthongs and my uh, geordie accent and you can find your park run dan's park run blogs on our country websites so do check out the many park run social media channels in the uk and across the world as well as subscribing to the various park run podcasts out there now more than ever it's important that we all come together and support each other the park run family is there for us all and we will get through this together thanks so much dan thanks everybody for tuning Thank in you. bye Thanks. Bye, bye, bye.